So what does it mean to transform in Photoshop? Well, transforming is simply making objects or images bigger, smaller, thinner, wider, shorter, taller, or even flipping it or rotating it. That's it. What's so special about it? Why should we learn about it in detail? Well, because transforming is the basis of Photoshop. To be able to perform all of the advanced techniques, transforming forms the fundamental technique that needs to be focused on. It's a prerequisite. Whether you're designing the next billboard cover or creating a beautiful fantasy composite without transforming, it would be impossible to do it with ease. In this lesson, you will learn everything you need to know about transformation in Photoshop, whether it is the use of anchor points or simple functions like flipping or aligning, we're gonna cover it all. We have some great examples lined up for you, so without any further ado, let's get started. Back in the magical world of Photoshop, and let's start with regular size transformations. Now keep in mind, changing the size in Photoshop is called scaling. I'm gonna repeat that for you. Scaling is changing the size in Photoshop, all right? So let's say we have a book. We have a simple book, very beautiful cover, isn't it? And the way it is created is pretty simple. I'm going to share that with you in detail. But for now, let's just know that there are three layers. Gray background, on top of that a simple gradient. And on top of that, we have the book with a shadow, right? We added a drop shadow. We're going to get to that. But right now, let's talk about transforming the book. Now, there are a couple ways of opening up the transformation controls. The first, you already might have guessed it, is control or command T, T for transform. This shows up. Now you can use it to just scale, change the size of the object or the image or the layer or whatever you might want to call it. And if you want to commit this change, press enter or return. It would be committed, applied. Press control or command T again. There's one more way to do it. Just click elsewhere. And this is only applicable to the later versions of Photoshop. So click anywhere other than the canvas and it will be applied. All right. Now, the other way of opening up the transformation controls is first of all, let's select that layer book layer and go to edit transform. Now, what do you want to do? You have to select scale. We need to change the size. That's why I told you changing the size is scaling. All right, let's choose scale. The same transformation controls are going to show up. Now, there's one more way. If you have the move tool selected, which we have it selected most of the time, at the top, you will have an option called show transform controls. If you check that, the transform controls will be turned on always. So now you can change the size and commit it. Okay. Now, even after you commit it, it's still there because this is checked. It'll always be checked and it won't be a problem for you. Whatever layer you select, the transform controls are going to show up even if you just uh, create a brand new layer. Let's take the brush tool and do some random stuff. And if you come back to the move tool, see the transform controls show up. So that is what happens if this is checked. Let's uncheck that because it's kind of disturbing for me personally. Let's delete this layer. Besides changing the size, there are a lot of things that you can do with it. First of all, if you press control or command D and then if you just drag in from one of the corners, it'll just equally increase the size. It will maintain the proportions. However, if you hold the shift key and then do it, well, it will not maintain the proportions. You can make it taller. You can make it thinner, wider, right? Interesting. Now, this is applicable to later versions of Photoshop 2020 and stuff. And you can also change it. So in other versions, it might be the opposite where if you hold the shift, it will maintain the proportions. And if you don't hold the shift, it won't maintain the proportions. So you might have to change those settings. And we have talked about it before in a previous video where we talked about transform and the confusion with previous versions of Photoshop. Just keep in mind, if you want to change it, you can always do that in your preferences by simply going to edit and then preferences on a Mac that would be under Photoshop and then preferences. And then if you go to general, if you check use legacy free transform in the latest version of Photoshop, then you would have to hold shift to maintain proportions. And if you release the shift, it will not maintain the proportions. All right. I know this is confusing. So if this works for you, fine, you don't have to touch any of that. But if you are used to the older versions and the way the older Photoshop versions worked, you might want to open up the preferences and check this checkbox. Okay. I'm not going to keep it checked and let's cancel it. All right. Now let's talk about the width and the height. Press control or command T again. And as soon as you do that at the top, you will have 
some options. Now this is a smart object. All right. So if the width and the height are at 100%, it means that the image is at its optimal quality. If we make it larger than 100%, it just means that we are making it bigger than it actually is. It's like making an image which is 100 by 100, we are enlarging it to 1000 by 1000. We are not going to invent the details, but Photoshop is going to guess and fill the gaps. And we have talked about it before. And decreasing it below 100 is just simply making it smaller than its original size. Okay, so 100 is the original size of this. You have the width and the height, and both are linked. Both are proportional, right? Now, if you decrease the height, the width also decreases. If you decrease the width, the height also decreases. If you click on this button, and if this is kind of unchecked, let's put it that way, or we might say, if this is unclicked, now when you change the height, it is independent of the width. Now when you change the width, it is independent of the height. Okay, let's set both of them to 100 and link them. Okay. Now you have the angle. Now, as you can see, the angle is a little more than it should be. Let's keep it zero. Angle is simply how much you have rotated it. That's pretty much it. And here you have the position, the X position and the Y position, right? We can change the position. Now, if you have this button clicked, it simply means that X and Y coordinates are measured from the center. That's it. So if you bring both of them to zero, our object would be at the absolute center, right? Now, the absolute center of the object, including the shadow, this the object includes the shadow. So this might not look like center, but you get the point. Now, one thing we have to keep in mind that with smart objects, we have some limited options. We don't need more options, but if you rasterize it, you would have more options. So let's commit this change, right click on it and let's rasterize it. Rasterize layer. Now, when you press control or command D, Besides these, you will see some other ones as well. There is this horizontal skew and vertical skew. If you increase the H, it just skews it horizontally. If you increase the V, it just skews it vertically. You can increase it or decrease it. And it's an angle based measurement. So let's keep them zero the way they were. Now there's a reason I showed you the simplified version of this composite. Let's go to the advanced because there's a thing that might boggle your mind. Let's take a look. So this my friend is the actual composite. Again, we have a simple solid gray background. We have a gradient on top of that. And on top of that, we had a simple book, right? Let's turn off the effect. Just a simple photo of a book. Now we applied some drop shadow effects on it. And the way we do that is pretty simple. I have applied two drop shadows. You double click on the right hand side of the layer. You can add another drop shadow if you want. So if you click on the plus, there would be one more drop shadow. You can move the shadow. It's a simple drop shadow that you can apply. I'm going to hit cancel. Yeah, you know, it's a simple layer style effect. Uh, just to make it more fun, let's apply one more layer style effect. If you double click on it, on the right hand side of the layer, the layer styles dialog box are going to show up. Let's choose something fun like bevel and emboss. Now it adds a nice bevel. We wouldn't want to do that in this example, but I just wanted to make a point. Let's select bevel and emboss and you can increase and play with the depth. You can play with the size. Let's keep it somewhere like this. You can soften it if you want. And uh, technique, I'm going to choose chisel hard. Really? Okay. Good. Now this is kind of a strange book. And on top of that, we just applied an image and we changed the blend mode to multiply to blend with it. Pretty fun, pretty simple. Now here's the problem with this. Now keep in mind this a uh, book photo is a smart object. And on top of that, we have applied some layer styles on top of that drop shadow, bevel and emboss and all sorts of stuff. Now, if we make it smaller, see what happens. Press control or command T. Let's say we make it 50% smaller. Choose 50. Look at what happens to the effects. The effects, you know, they have not scaled accordingly, right? They are of the same measurement. Look at the shadow. It has also not scaled accordingly. If I press Ctrl or Command T again, and let's make it 
20% or let's go for 10% size. Let's look at the effects. They have not scaled proportionately, right? It should have been like a border around and there should have been some good shadows, but it's gone. It's just the effects are not scaling. The object is scaling. What to do? Let's go back. Here's what you got to do. Let's say you reduced the size by 50%. Okay. Now all you have to do is to go to layer and then layer style and choose scale effects right here. And here you can choose 50%. Hit enter or return. And there you go. They have scaled proportionately. Now I accept I did a mistake. I forgot to include this illustration. So let's zoom out. Okay. All you have to do is to select both of these layers, select the first one, hold the control or command, select the element graphic element as well. Press control or command T. Let's make this 50% or you can just resize it yourself. Okay. All you have to do is just know how much you resized it. Just select it, press control or command T. It's going to show you 41.73, right? So let's go to layer, layer style, and then scale effects. It was 41.73. It seems like we cannot use decimals. So we have to use something like 42 or 41. So let's go with 42 because it was 41.73 close to 42. We need to round that off. Hit OK. And there you have it. You have it scaled as well. All right, let's come back. And we didn't want bevel and emboss. So let's just drag it to the trash can. Now let's talk about reference points. You see, reference points are one of the most underrated features in Photoshop, but in my opinion, it's one of the most useful things that people usually ignore. Let's see how it works. So here we have a simple picture of a photo frame. On top of that, we have a gray placeholder. We changed the blend mode to multiply to blend that well with that of the frame. Now let's bring in an image. So here we are in our finder or explorer and I'm just going to drag this image girl in snow and drop it at the top. Now you want to limit it to that gray placeholder. And how do we do that? By holding the alt key or the option key and clicking on the line between these two layers. That way you create a clipping mask. This picture of girl in snow is limited to this placeholder. If you select this image, you can press control or command T. You can move it around. You will see that it won't go anywhere. It is limited to just that placeholder. It won't go outside of that. Now we need to enlarge or make the image smaller or larger accordingly. So first of all, let's say we adjusted the image accordingly, just like this. Now we know that we have to keep the head. Let's say someone wants to keep the head in the middle or a little bit to the right hand side. Now you need to make the image larger, but keep the head in the same place. So usually what would people do? They would make the image larger and then they would move the head right there, make the image even larger, move the head right there. Well, that's not a very efficient way to do it. What we need right now are reference points. So this, my friend, that you see is a reference point. When we make it bigger, it becomes larger from this reference point. Make sense? So. The way we do that is by bringing the reference point to the head. Okay. Another way of bringing reference points somewhere is by holding the alt key or the option key and then clicking on an area to take the reference point right there. If you cannot see the reference point, if it is hidden, make sure this button is checked. This is hide reference point button. So check it. You will be able to see it. Hold the alt key or the option key click on the head or you can just drag it and bring it right there. And then when you make it bigger, let's say by holding the alt key or the option key, then when you make it bigger, it would make it larger from that anchor point. Keep in mind, you have to hold the alt key or the option key to make it larger from that anchor point or reference point, whatever you want to call it. So when we make it bigger, see the head is in the same place. I like this view. I'm going to keep it at that. Hit enter or return. Let me show you one more application of this. A lot of people like to follow the rule of thirds in photography and while cropping their images. So what does the rule of thirds say? 
Well, the rule of thirds is simply this. If you divide your images into three parts, the important areas would be around the intersections. It doesn't make sense. Well, let me try to make sense out of it. So first of all, let's go to view and then new guide layout. We're going to create some guides so you can increase or decrease the amount of columns and rows. So first of all, make sure both columns and rows are checked. We don't want any margin. We don't want center columns or if you want to clear existing columns, you can do that anyway. So let's choose the number of columns to be three and rows to be three because it is the rule of thirds. If you divide them into three, hit OK. These are just guides. If you press Control or Command and colon, it's going to go away. If you press that again, it's going to come back. So the rule of thirds. So the rule of thirds say that the important parts of the image or where the attention should go should stay in one of these intersections here, here, here or here. So let's say I want to keep the eyes, the left eye on one of these points. So let's press Ctrl or Command T. It's not doing anything. Why? Because the background layer is locked. So let's unlock it by clicking on the lock and right click on the layer and let's choose convert to smart object so that when we resize it, we don't lose the details. Press Ctrl or Command T. Now, first of all, let's move the eye to that intersection. Now bring the anchor point or the reference point to the eye or hold the Alt key or the Option key, click in right there. And then let's say you want to crop it. You want to make it look like a close up for a billboard or a skincare product, but you want to keep the eye right there. So now you can easily hold the Alt key or the Option key make it larger and have a look. The eye will be right there at that intersection, no matter how big or small you make it. Reference points are also very important when it comes to rotating in Photoshop. So let's say we have to move her hand a little bit. Okay. So first of all, let's select her hand with the lasso tool selected. Let's make a loose selection of her hand just like so. All right. Now let's press Ctrl or Command J to make a copy of that area into another layer. So in this layer, as you can see, we have just the hand. Now press Ctrl or Command T. If you want to rotate the hand a little bit, usually what people would do, they would rotate it and then move it to the joint. They would rotate it even more and then move it to the joint. Now, instead of doing that, let's go back. Let's press Ctrl or Command and then bring the reference point to the joints right here. This is where the hand will move from right, right here. It should be right about right there. And then when you move it, it'll move around that reference point. If you move it too much, you can see the hand right there, but that's not a problem. We can always remove that. But anyway, let's say you wanted to move it this way and you can keep it at that. Now you can click on the mask button right there and soften it out by selecting the brush. Make sure it is a soft round brush and then just zoom in and then erase the extras from here just like this. Make it a little softer. You know the drill. This is not anything complicated. Make it a little smaller. Make sure they're matching properly. You know little things like this. Okay, just play with it, deal with it. Now you can make this area a little softer. Or what you can do is um, just for a quick fix. Here's what I would do. I would create a brand new layer. Press Control, Alt, Shift and E to create a stamp out of it to merge everything that you're seeing in the canvas right now into one layer. Then we're going to use the patch tool. We're going to be talking about that in detail later. But right now, let's simply choose the patch tool. It's in the healing group. All right. Let's select the areas that look messy and just make sure source is selected and we're going to drag it to an area which we should sample from and it is fixed. Let's talk about other areas. Let's fix other areas. So select this area, which looks a little messy. So we're going to select that and then you're going to just drag it to the left. Press Control or Command D and there you have it fixed. So here's the before, here's the after waving gently. There you go. One more thing. There are some reference point presets. So let's say we select this image by pressing Control or Command D 
to show the transform controls. So right now, as you can see, you can see that reference point right there because it is checked, of course. Now it's in the middle. If you want to bring it to one of those corners, you can choose it from right here. Now it's on one of these corners. So these are some presets that you can click on to bring it to certain positions. So in the left bottom corner, right bottom corner, and bottom middle, right? So let's say I want to keep it in a corner like this. So I'm just going to click on this button right there, and then we can rotate it from that point, right? So there are some presets, just know that it might be handy in the future. Now let's do something fun. Let's talk about distort. So here we have a picture of a car, and let's say we want to paste some graphics on it. Sounds interesting, isn't it? So let's go to our finder or explorer. So we have some car graphics. So I'm just going to drag it and drop it into Photoshop. So just drop it right over there. Now let's adjust the size. We're going to place it here. Okay. But we still need to adjust it. How do we make it match the perspective of the car? Well, all we have to do is to right click on it and then choose distort. So after you have activated the transform controls, you can right click on it and choose distort. Other way is you can also go to edit, transform and distort. Okay. Now let's just make it a little larger from there and then adjust the perspective. There you go. See, match it with that of the car. You don't have to be very, very accurate. This looks okay. After all, this is just graphics, but this is just to make a point that with distort, you can move any of the four points anywhere. You can also move this points, these points to make it a little uh, thinner and wider and taller. You get the point. Just match the perspective. This looks all right. Hit enter or return once you're satisfied. And then with blend modes, we can always blend it. So for this one, let's change this to multiply because this is a white car. Would look good on multiply. Also, if you want to bring back some shine, you can always double click on the right hand side of the left and then take it away from the bright areas of the underlying layer. By taking the slider of the underlying layer from right to left, it just goes away from the bright areas. But we don't want to take it away so much and we don't want to be so harsh. So hold the Alt key or the Option key, click on the slider to break it apart and then take it all the way apart and slowly and gradually control how much you want to show the highlights. Okay, hit OK once you're satisfied. Now we need to mask it, of course. So click on the mask button. Take the brush. You can just paint with black just to take it away from the areas where it doesn't belong. You can take all the time in the world to do it and paint with white in case you paint extra and remove extra. You can always press X to toggle between the foreground and the background color. You can also use selection tools. We're going to be talking about that later in this course. But you can also use selection tools to get rid of that as well. Now, I have to show you one more thing right here. Just be fair with me. I'm not going to do a great job here. Just quickly do something that looks just okay. All right, I'm going to quickly remove it from this area. Okay. Now there is a problem with this. The graphics look all right. They look okay. But there is a problem. If you zoom in right here, they look all right. No problem at all. But if you zoom in at the back, something looks off. You know what it is? Well, there is a shallow depth of field, right? If you look closely, the front areas are focused and the areas at the back are out of focus. So they are blurred a little bit and they should be blurred. However, the graphics are not blurred. So we need to blur it at the back. And how can we do that? So select the graphics first and then go to filter, blur gallery, field blur. We have learned this previously. So just move the point at the back and then zoom in and then control the blur accordingly. Zoom in. We just need to match the blur of the graphic with that of the blur of the other parts. So let's slowly and gradually increase it. Three is not enough. What about eight? Eight looks kind of all right. Let's go for nine. Okay. 
now we need to create one more point for zero blur right here because we don't want much blur here as well so just click to create one more point and in this case let's choose the blur to be zero or maybe one graphics should have little blur okay so hit okay now it will begin to look realistic because as the focus goes away the graphics should blur as well along with the car there you go at the back the graphics are blurred and in the front they are in focus you can also color the graphics if you want to so let's click on the adjustment layer icon and then choose hue saturation you can choose color wise or change the hue if you want now we only want to limit it to the graphics so you can hold the alt key or the option key and click on the line between these two layers or simply click on this button it does the same thing creates clipping mask you can change the hue or you can just check color wise that way you can choose whatever color you want and then you can control the saturation of that and the red looks pretty good i'm gonna make it a little more saturated there you go this is interesting as well so i'm gonna keep it at that maybe you you might want to keep it something different that's different that's totally up to you and there you have it you can also keep it black and white by simply just decreasing the saturation this is also very interesting that's totally up to you now let's create a wonderful effect using a feature called flipping so let's create a brand new document by going to file new and we, we can create something exciting let's go to art and illustration and choose 2000 pixel grid let's create it let's create a black background so click on the adjustment layer icon and then choose solid color and choose black okay we can delete the background layer we don't need it or we could have also just uh, painted black in the background layer. it doesn't matter we have a solid background on top of that let's click on the fourth text layer okay now let's choose the text tool and type something fun flipping you cannot see it because the text is black so double click on the t to select it and single click at the top again what did we learn in the previous lessons for tools any tool you select the options for that tool will be at the top in the options bar so let's choose white and let's choose the font Gilroy extra bold okay let's make it a little larger okay bring it in the center now we want to create a reflection of it well you can make a duplicate by pressing Ctrl or Command J and then you can press Ctrl or Command T and rotate it just like this. And by the way, let me give you one more tip. While you are rotating, if you hold the Shift key, it will rotate by 15 degrees at a time. So it will help you keep things straight and quantized. So let's say, let's bring it down here so that you can see what's happening. If I don't hold the shift key, the rotation is smooth. But if I hold the shift key, it will maintain 15 degrees. First of all, it's zero. Now it's 15. Now it's 30. As you can see in the side, now it's 45. Now it's 90. You see what's happening? Okay. So if you want to keep it completely, if you want to just rotate it absolutely clockwise in 90 degrees. You can always hold the shift key and quickly do that. It won't be 91 or 92 or 89 or anything like that. If you don't hold the shift key, that would happen. Okay. Anyway, so let's rotate it. Now, when we place it under, well, it's not kind of looking like a reflection because reflections are flipped. So press control or command T. And now we need to select how do you want to flip it? So you can flip it vertically or flip it horizontally. So let's choose flip horizontal. And now it is matching. There you go. You have a nice reflection. Also, one more way we could have done this. Let's make a copy again by pressing Ctrl or Command J. We have the copy. We can press Ctrl or Command T, right click on it and then choose flip vertical. Now bring it down. So I wanted to show you the difference between flipping it vertical and horizontal. Flip vertical just flips it vertically. Flip horizontal flips it horizontally. That's it. Okay, now let's bring it a little bit at the top. To make it look more like a reflection, we need to keep a little gap. Okay, now let's click on the mask button. Let's choose the gradient to black to white. And let's make a gradient from black to white. Something like this looks like a nice reflection. Okay, this does look like a good reflection. Okay, there you go. Wonderful reflection for flipping by flipping the flipping text. Now let's learn aligning. Let's say you're a clothing brand 
and you're creating a big billboard and you want to place some text on it. You want to keep it in center. So first of all, let's type something for this series of clothes. Let's just type something random. The Adeline series. I'm just randomly typing a name, but anyway, let's make it a little larger. By the way, this font is Bodoni. If you're interested, if you double click on the T at the top, you would see Bodoni MT condensed. Now the way we have made it luxurious is by adding some space to it. Let me reset it. Okay. Now the way you add spaces, first of all, you can, you can, you can click on this button and then increase the space from right here after selecting the text or what you can do, you can hold the alt key or the option key and then the right arrow key to increase the space, the left arrow key to decrease the space. In typography, this is called tracking. Okay. Let's increase the space. Okay. There you go. It makes it a little more premium. Now you can always go to view and choose snap and also snap to guides, grids, layers, and document bounds. That way, whenever you try to keep it in the center, it'll automatically center it. Now there are lots of other ways of aligning this as well. So let's say you need to align it in the center of the entire document. You can press control or command a to select all of it. When you have the move tool selected at the top, you will have these buttons. This will align it vertically. If we didn't want to do that, let's go back by pressing control or command Z. This will align it. If you click on it, align it horizontally. Okay. Now you can just press these buttons to see what they do. Now keep in mind that it is simply just aligning according to the selection you have made. And that works with text. Press Ctrl or Command D to deselect that. Once we deselect that, all of these are grayed out. Okay. But if you click on these three dots and let's say you want to align it according to the canvas already without making a selection, well, just simply choose align to canvas. Now all of these are active back again. Let's move it haywire and you can still align it according to the canvas. Is it making it confusing? Let's move on to the next lesson. But before we do, let's give it a nice spot in the center. So let's say it was not in the center. You, it was placed over there. You want to center it horizontally. We centered it. Now to make the text a little more visible, we created a solid color adjustment layer and choose black and then select the mask, choose a gradient and make a gradient something like this. Now we need to make the gradient less visible. So decrease the opacity to about 30. Now have a look. The text pops out even more and you don't even realize that any gradient is there. If someone looks at it for the first time. All right, let me give you one more example. It'll make it absolutely clear for you. So we have this image on the book. Okay. Now let's say this book and the image were somewhere else. And also let's move the image somewhere not very aligned. So if I select the image, then move it somewhere here. This is not very much aligned. Okay. Now, if I select the move tool, right, right now, if you click on the three dots, this is set to align to canvas, right? Now, if you try to align it horizontally by clicking on this button, it would be at the center of the canvas, the horizontal center of the canvas. If you click on it, it'll be vertically centered, right? But in respect to the canvas, not to the book, if you want to center it according to the book, what would you do? First of all, make a selection of the book. For that, hold the control or command, click on the thumbnail of the book layer. So whatever is in that layer would be selected. Then make sure that the image layer is selected and then change the properties to align to selection. Now it will align it based on the selection. Now when you center it horizontally, it'll be in the center of the selection. Now when you center it vertically, it'll be in the center of the selection vertically. <laughs> Makes sense. Press control or command D to deselect. And now as you can see, all of these are grayed out because it's based on selection and there is no selection 
I hope that made sense to you. Now, there are so many things we can do with just transform and it forms an essential part of everything we do here in Photoshop. This might look like a basic tool and function, but having a good understanding of the same will help you in the long run. I hope this video helps you and thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next lesson and it's going to be a really exciting one because it is the building block of compositing. Till then, stay tuned and make sure that you keep creating.